You're listening to the Jolly Swagman Podcast. Here's your host, Joe Walker. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, swagmen and swagettes. Welcome back to the show. It's great to be back. I hope you are well. This episode might be one that's more for the Australian listeners, if I'm being completely honest. It is fairly parochial in parts, so sorry to my international audience, although of course you're still more than welcome to listen. Just promise me that you won't get the wrong impression of our beautiful city of Sydney. My guest is Kate McClymont. Kate is an investigative journalist at the Sydney Morning Herald, where she's worked more or less continuously since 1985. Kate's specialty is exposing crime and corruption. And in so doing, she has become the most awarded journalist in Australia since 1992. She has won no fewer than seven Walkley Awards, including Australian journalism's greatest honour, a gold Walkley, which she won for her coverage of the salary cap scandal that saw the rugby league team, the Canterbury-Bankstown Bulldogs, thrown out of the National Rugby League competition. It's fair to say that Kate might understand Sydney's criminal underworld better than some of its own participants. Former Labor MP Eddie Obede, a long-run betonoir of Kate's, who now resides in prison as a result of Kate's reporting, once said of her, quote, she has become the journalistic equivalent of a gun mole with glittering associations with the not-so-well-to-do. Kate often risks her own safety in exposing Sydney's underbelly and in so doing receives death threats. She once said of those who she investigates who send her death threats to cease her reporting that, quote, I would like people to know that it just makes it worse for you. If you're going to threaten to kill me, I will just keep going, end quote. How could you not love someone like Kate McClymont? So without much further ado, please enjoy our conversation. Kate McClyman, thanks for joining me. My pleasure. Very happy to speak to you. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to meet you was I have a real thing for investigative journalists. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've had your uh, colleague Adele Ferguson on the podcast, uh, but there's some kind of skin in the game thing that I find very honourable about the profession. You, you take downside risks in your work. Oh, I wish there was more <laughs> upside risks. <laughs> But I mean, t- so how many how many death threats have you had in your life? Can you count them? Um, well, I think I've had three. I, I mean, three sort of serious ones. Right. Um, and other ones, um, yes, other ones. I I had a disturbing one um, about eighteen months ago, and it was a um, somebody had set up a website um, with my name and had put all this stuff on there and had sent me a photo of myself with masking tape over my face. Mm. And it was, I have to say, that was kind of unsettling. A bit visual. Yes. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) But I've had them, um, yes, we've had to move out of our home in the past. But now that my children are grown up, it's it's something that I don't worry about as much as I used to. I was more worried about anything that might happen to them. Mm. But about myself, I don't worry too much. Mm -hmm. What's your protocol when you get a death threat? Look, you have to tell your work. um, And depending on the level of seriousness, you have to tell the police. Right. I read someone gave you this advice that it's the death threats that you don't receive. Well, well, (laughs) those are the ones you should worry about. I know. Look, a a police officer once said, look, if it's any consolation, it's um, the people that you have to worry about are the ones that aren't threatening yeah. you. Yeah. I thought, oh my God, there's a lot of them. It's <laughs> making me more worried. So I want to discuss some of the stories you've broken across your, your long and uh, storied career and then draw out some of the principles and patterns that we, we might learn from them. But first, I want to ask you about uh, when you were busking in King's Cross as a university student. This is, this is kind of like your log cabin story, isn't it? <laughs> I know. Well, I sort of think it's kind of funny that I'm sure that that's the only reason I got a cadetship at the Herald was because they thought that was really funny. And what it was was that, um, you know, I have absolutely no singing or dancing 
capability whatsoever, but I can talk. So I had um, the busking booth was questions answered 40 cents, arguments 50 cents and verbal abuse $1. And it was amazing how many young men would come along and pay me a dollar to have their girlfriends abused. (laughs) So the first thing I would say was what appalling taste they had in that boyfriend. (laughs) But you never saw it the other way around. Girls didn't pay a dollar to have their boyfriends abused. I think very interesting. Interesting. (laughs) Maybe maybe times have changed. (laughs) Be interesting to see what the pattern would be now. (laughs) But, I mean, I don't want to make too much of that experience because – I'm sure you were, you were very good at talking to people across all walks of life before that. You know, you're a country girl, aren't you? Yes, yeah. yes. Um, and look, I think that has been perhaps one of the secrets to my um, my journalistic success is that I genuinely like people. I'm interested in them. I'm interested in what they're doing. And, uh, you know, I like talking to them. It doesn't matter what kind of person they are. And I think it's that ability, hopefully, to put people at ease. Because the thing about journalism, especially when a lot of it is just over the phone, you have to make some kind of connection to the person that you're talking to. You have to weigh up, you know, pretty quickly how you can relax that person, how you can gain their trust and how you can keep them talking. And they're absolutely, um, you know, vital Mm. tools for any kind of journalist, really. Do you have any tricks that you use consciously? I don't. I don't like to think of them as tricks. Sure. But the most essential thing is to put somebody at their ease. And um, I find now that, you know, if I ring up and I say, oh, it's Kate McClymont here, you can hear. (gasps) (laughs) So you have to say fairly quickly, um, look, I'm just hoping that you might be able to help me. It's always better if you can, um, you know, seek input and information from another person. You know, it's, it's... that's something that people generally relax about, that they might be of assistance or, yeah, so I try to relax people by saying, you know, I'm hoping that you might be able to help me. Got it. Did you kill your mother? <laughs> <laughs> How much skullduggery really lurks beneath Sydney's polite veneer? So much. It's hard <laughs> to even begin to tell you. And the thing is, is that, um, like, a lot of the people that um, – that I deal with, I mean, a lot of criminals are basically, they're criminals because they're not very smart, but the white collar criminals get away with it because they are clever. Like the amount of insider trading, Hmm. you know, swapping of confidential information, getting a tip off that, you know, such and such a land is about to be rezoned. That's the top end of town and that's where the real money is. But interestingly enough, Um, a lot of, say, bikey gangs and things like that, they have, um, you know, partially moved their business from typical um, drug importations and drug distribution to things like mortgage fraud, uh, um, which I find a really interesting development because it's harder to detect, it's, um, it's much harder to prove and to track down. But I think that that's an interesting movement in the, the criminal milieu. Huh. I was going to ask you if there, is, there was anything especially venal about Sydney. You might have hinted at an answer there. We, we do have a very frothy property market here. But I, that's the thing. Like where there is money to be made, you will find criminality. Yeah. And I think Sydney with its, um, with it, its land, its property prices... Um, there's always money to be paid there. I mean, I think we're basically a town of speculators, really. Mm. Going back to the earliest days, Governor Macquarie put a uh, a ban on land speculation in the early days of the colony. Oh yeah, and also um, on the rum trade. Mm. I think that was <laughs> that, <laughs> that was, was a, a big, a big one too. Yes. Yeah. So, and that's the other thing. As soon as you make something um, illegal, its value on the black market automatically. Rises. I mean, you just look at the um, the bootlegging during the Prohibition yeah. uh, era in the the US. 
Because so, the supply yes, is restricted. Yeah, once the supply is restricted, mm. demand goes up and people are happy to pay for it. Yeah. And I s- sometimes wonder, um, you know, about drug decriminalisation, whether the rates of addiction, I think, overseas have not gone up when, um, you know, things like cannabis have been decriminalised. Mm. So it would be interesting to see what would happen here. Yeah. A great economist, uh, Charles Kindleberger, who was one of the original students of uh, of Bubbles. He wrote a book called Manias, Panics and Crashes, which is kind of one of the seminal texts in uh, economic bubble literature, once uh, wrote that fraud and swindling are demand determined. So all these <laughs> people that. come out of the woodwork in a, in a very frothy market. But it's interesting to hear you say that Bikies have been exploiting mortgage fraud. How, how would a bikie profit from mortgage fraud? Okay, so what happens, um, and this happened to uh, the head of the Hells Angels, Felix Lyle, who had um, been drummed out of the, well, in fact, he became the head of the Bandidos, but he'd been drummed out of the Hells Angels for not being of good character. Yeah. I love that, that you can be <laughs> expelled <laughs> from a bikey gang yeah. for not being, perhaps it wasn't, yes. Anyway, so <laughs> what he and um, uh, a group of other people had done was that they realised that um, financial institutions wouldn't send somebody out to do a valuation on properties of less than, say, $250,000. So they would identify, you know, like a garage in Leichhardt and they would, you know, falsify, they would get a loan, they would put it in somebody else's name, the the valuation, you know, it might have been worth $20,000, suddenly it would become $250,000, they'd get the money and then they'd run off with it. And then when when the person defaulted, they would find that they'd actually lent money on a, you know, a tiny garage. Mm. And they did that also by stealing title deeds to people's houses, Mm -hmm. um, you know, doing all kinds of measures that basically just involves financial institutions, you know, perhaps not doing their due diligence. And, you know, that was, that was what, in fact, eventually brought Felix Lyle down. He was um, jailed over that. So it wasn't the, um, you know, amphetamine trafficking or any of the um, accused standover work he'd done. No, it was mortgage fraud that, um, you know, brought him down. And Hmm. and in the end, he was um, deported back to England for not being of good character. So, (laughs) (laughs) yes, so his his character test failed him on many occasions. (laughs) If there was one industry or sector in Sydney that you'd love to shine a spotlight on and, and know everything there is to know about it transparently, which which would it be? Where do you think the most corruption is? I think apart from um, property developing and land and, and local councils, which yeah. I think is absolutely rife, right. I think white collar crime and insider trading, mm-hmm. um, that would be just absolutely, you know, fantastic mm. to have a good look at that. But of course... That relies on whistleblowers and also on, you know, patterns of buying that would only really be able to be looked at by, um, you know, ASIC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's – unless someone's going to leak you that information, that's hard to determine really. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about Eddie Obede because you had a – I would love to talk about Eddie Obede. You can't? The on- Look, the only thing is is that um, he is about to face a criminal trial and he's just had his trial put off mm-hmm. because of mentions <laughs> of him and his behaviour. Right. So, Can we talk um, about anything relating to Eddie Obede? Look, I think it might be advisable <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> as much as it is one of my all-time favourite <laughs> subjects. Yeah. Um, I just think for the um, the sake of not being in contempt okay. of court oh. and not <laughs> – I think it, it would be best that, um, yes, we look elsewhere. All right. All right. I don't want to be held in contempt. So. <laughs> no. no. Or, or you. No. Uh, yeah. I want to ask you about your first ever death threat. I think you're about my age and you're working over in Bondi Junction, oh. where, where, I, where I now live. What, can, you, can you tell us that story? I believe it involved a wedding. Well, yes. So um, as a cadet, I was um, 
um, you, you, you were dispatched to various realms and this was when the Herald actually had, you know, like a vast empire. So mm. we, had, um, we had a Northern Herald and we had um, an Eastern Herald and they were basically supplements that appeared in the main Herald once a week. Mm. So I was dispatched to be um, the writer of a column called Chums, <laughs> which <laughs> sort of was meant to be this – you know, eastern suburbs, you know, bouffant hair, shoulder pads, <laughs> who was doing what at, you know, fabulous cocktail parties. And I soon became very tired of that. So I took myself off to um, the um, the chapel at King Coppel, uh, Rose Bay, where um, a major underworld figure, George Freeman, his sister-in-law was getting married and his wife was... Uh, one of the bridesmaids, and his son was the page boy. Anyway, I thought I was being hilarious by writing that the um, the bridesmaids were wearing sequins, which was the closest fashion accessory allowable, <laughs> um, you know, apart from wearing armour plating. <laughs> and also um, we had a photo of George Freeman and his bodyguard, who was this big, you know, meat-headed lump of a man. And at the time... There was a very popular British TV series called Minder and there was a small time underworld figure that had a Minder and the theme song was I Could Be So Good For You and that was the, the, the title of our caption under George Freeman and his Minder. But the other thing that made me laugh at the time was that we had a photo of um, George Freeman's son um, Adam carrying, you know, a beautiful embroidered pillow with the ring on it. And fast forward sort of like, you know, 21 years and there is Adam in jail <laughs> for <laughs> some offence. And I thought, oh, you know, and he started off so innocently. But anyway, so George Freeman did not see the humour in my story about the wedding of his sister-in-law. And so I started getting these threats at my house and um, I told the, you know, I eventually told the um, the police and, you know, I had to tell work and they put a trace on my, um, you know, th- at the time we only had landlines, they put a trace on my um, phone. Hmm. I never got one more call and it later turned out that George Freeman had been tipped off by the police. <laughs> so um, and I sort of felt at the time, you know, maybe people thought I was making it up, but my flatmates complained because they were answering the phone as well mm. with George is not happy. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever had your phone tapped? Um, uh, yes, uh, yes. How do you know when a phone's been tapped? You don't. But sometimes um, you can hear a sort of like a double echo at the beginning but also um, my calls have appeared on other people's tapped phones <laughs> as well. <laughs> like, you know, you're ringing up and, um, you know, suddenly, you know, in some inquiry later on, you know, there's your voice on the phone. But I, there, was, um, there was a very funny moment when I was covering the murder trial of Ron Medich and um, they played this phone tap and his assistant, Lucky Gatilari, who'd carried out the murder on his behalf, mm. said, um, hey, Ron, your number one fan's been on the phone to me, that Kate McClymont. And Ron, in his high-pitched squeak, says, ah, she never wrote anything but rubbish about me. It's all rubbish. <laughs> and Lucky said, you know, hold on, hold on. She's actually making inquiries about me. <laughs> so after that, when I used to see, um, you know, I'd pass Ron, I'd say, hello, Ron. It's your number one fan here. And he never thought that was the slightest bit funny. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you about that whole saga. So you, you just have a book out called uh, Dead Man Walking. That's right. About Ron Medich's contract killing of Michael, uh, Michael McGurk. McGurk. Who was Michael McGurk? Michael McGurk was a, um, a very upmarket, shifty, shyster from Cremorne. He was a spiv in a suit. Mm. And, you know, the things that he had on the boil, you know, just about all of them involved a degree of criminality. 
Um, so at the time of his death, he was actually blackmailing the Sultan of Brunei, and <laughs> <laughs> you know the, the world's richest man. And previously, he had tried to sell the Sultan a matchbox size miniature Koran that he'd bought from a KGB colonel in Moscow and then tried to sell it to the Sultan for $8 million. Um, And at the time, the Sultan was about to marry a, um, I think it was wife number three, who was a beautiful young Malaysian newsreader. And um, McGurk was trying to get him to buy it as a wedding gift for his new bride. But the wedding came and went and there was no such sale. So... McGurk did what he always did, which was start suing people. And it was the most ludicrous suit ever because another um, typical thing of not just Michael McGurk but Ron Medich, there never seemed to be any paperwork involved in any of their deals. So he claimed that he had an oral contract to sell the miniature Koran to the (laughs) Sultan of Brunei. And so he started a lawsuit in the New South Wales Supreme Court that sadly um, it went all the way to the High Court and he <laughs> lost at every turn. But that didn't stop him. Um, and I can't tell you the details of what he was trying to blackmail the Sultan over because it's still the subject of a worldwide suppression order that the Sultan took out in jurisdictions all over the world. Wow. Yeah, so that was just one thing that he had on the he, boil. He's a fascinating character. I mean, he, so he's a Glaswegian originally. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And he also had, um, he was um, embroiled with standing over good friends of Felix Lyle, as we mentioned, the former bikey boss. Yeah. Um, he'd, you know, fraudulently, um, you know, like even his own house, he had borrowed. You know, the house was mortgaged about eight times over and, you know, he was always desperate for money. So he'd gone to get another loan against the house. But, of course, there were caveats on the house and a caveat is a legal legal title that expresses that the caveator has an interest in that house. So he just simply uh, made up the name of a solicitor, made up the name of a JP, fraudulently um, removed those title so he could borrow more money <laughs> like there was absolutely <laughs> no skullduggery that was yeah. below him and at the time of his death he was actually embroiled in legal actions with Ron Medich and Ron Medich I soon discovered lived up to his nickname which was Cotties because he was like the thick and rich ice cream <laughs> flavoured <laughs> topping. So, As in stupid, stupid but wealthy. Stupid but yeah. wealthy. And um, Ron Medich had made an absolute fortune when he was in business with his younger brother Roy. Mm. And it soon turned out that you realised that Roy was the brains of the operation. And when the, the two brothers... Um, <clears throat> you know, had a dispute and fell apart. So did Ron, you know, Ron just became this magnet for a whole lot of 'er ne'er-do-wells eager to get part of his fortune. Mm. And in Ron's life, there was always a central acolyte, but a new acolyte would come along and what they had to do was to get rid of the previous one. So Kind of like the the Sith. Yes, exactly. So McGurk had done that to the previous one. And then, um, you know, Medich had stupidly given McGurk his power of attorney for a week. And McGurk went out and bought not one but two properties, um, lied to Medich, um, you know, with Ron's money and said that, you know, he'd bought them for, you know, say $6 million when he in fact bought them for $3 million, he'd pocketed the difference. And it was only when Ron's much smarter wife, Odetta, cottoned on to this that McGurk came unstuck as Medich's favourite. And at the time of his murder, they were embroiled 
in legal actions about this ripoff. So these two the, former yeah, the, the, friends, the, yes, the two Medich former McGurk. friends. Yeah. But you know how I got onto the story in the first place was that somebody had tipped me off that there was a firebombing in Wolseley Road hmm. in Point Piper. Now Wolseley Road is the most expensive strip of real estate in Australia, so. You know, you can imagine, a, you know, a firebombing. And it turned out <laughs> and that... And the, the 10th most expensive, expensive strip in, in the, the world. T- entire world, exactly. Yeah. So it turned out that um, McGurk... I'm oh, sorry, Medic had um, moved from the western suburbs at the um, bequest of his, you know, um, second wife, Odetta, who'd come from Lithuania. And they'd bought a house in Wolseley Road and then, as you do... You haven't even moved in when you find an even better house in the same street. So that left Ron to offload the first house. So he sold it to Adam Tilly, who didn't have the money to buy the house, so Ron lent him the money to buy his old house. And when he didn't pay back the money, Ron employed McGurk to get it from him. So at first McGurk tried what he liked best was lawsuits and then he went on to what he liked second best which was extortion firebombing and he'd actually been charged with the firebombing of not only that house but also the house of a valuer that McGurk had been trying to get to revalue properties for their twice their value and also the Balmoral house of a um Um, a high-profile real estate agent, Justin Brown. And so the police charged him because they were worried that he was actually going to kill somebody. Mm. But it was that, um, you know, and we couldn't work out at the time why McGurk had originally tried, you know, to sue Adam Tilly. And then somehow it had all turned around and now Medich and McGurk were at each other's necks and... Uh, Medich was now suing Tilly himself, so it was all over this one house. But the way all the f- you know the finances were done and people falling in and out of favour with other people, it was all craziness. And I can understand why it took the police a year to make the arrests, because as people told us at the time, like there were so many people that wanted McGurk dead. It could have been you know mm. any number of people. Um, you know, were suspects. So, you know, when you are the police, not only do you have to prove who did do it, but the defence is going to offer up a whole lot of other suspects. So you have to have done enough work to eliminate them as a suspect. So there was there was quite a lot of right. work done, um, you know, along those lines. I imagine that would slow things down in yes. McGurk's case. Yes. I, I want to come back to McGurk's character briefly because just the incredible chutzpah of this man would shock uh, many of us. So he's born in Glasgow in 1964. Correct. Uh, difficult childhood, alcoholic parents, uh, kind of a quite a distant, abusive mother a- and father for that matter. Yeah. yeah. I th- well, I think the um, his parents split up when he was small mm. and he went off to um, – so his mother only took, um, you know – two children with her and left the older two children with the father. So... um, His two older brothers. Yeah, the the two older brothers stayed with With the the father. father. And I think one became a um, a rather feared standover man whose name was um, Jake Hatchett McGurk. (laughs) (laughs) It's a very Scottish uh, name. I know, exactly. (laughs) But it was interesting because I think that um, McGurk definitely seemed to have... um, sociopathic tendencies Hmm. Um, and early on he moved to um, a a town in Germany that was um, Kaiserslautern or otherwise known as K-Town and there was a big American uh, military base there and he was selling Mercedes Benzes. This is in his 20s? Yeah, this is in his 20s. Um, So he told this um, serviceman that he would give him, you know, there was a huge discount on um, the Mercedes if you paid in cash. So the guy, you know, gets the cash, comes in, McGurk basically takes the bag of cash and scoots straight out the back door. It's like 50,000 <laughs> US dollars. Yes, it was an enormous yeah. amount of money and um, wasn't seen, 
you know, for, for dust. And the same thing happened here. His first job, um, he arrived in Australia in his late 20s and his first job was at a, a Jaguar dealership in Hornsby and he was fired for basically you know, giving false um, promises to clients saying, if you buy this car, I will throw in an air conditioner <laughs> or, a, um, you know, a... Um, you know, what do you call those roof, um, open roof things? What are they called? Um, On a car? Yeah. Yeah, I can't remember. Um, well, well, we know what we mean. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, sunroof. You know, yeah. he, he would throw in those things and, of course, they would buy the car and then he would renege on the deal. And that's what he would do <laughs> his entire life. He was this extraordinary um, salesman who just lied and cheated his way but he also did it to, you know, fellow parents. There was this... Um, of his the, children's school. Uh, of his children's school. Like, apart from flogging, you know, knock-off Louis Vuitton handbags <laughs> to the mothers <laughs> at the school, he had, um, <laughs> he had um, two of his oldest sons, you know, you know, fathers from Riverview, had given him money for a business deal. And the money had disappeared. So they organised to have coffee to basically say to him, look, enough's enough, we need our money back. And he just slid across the coffee table a piece of paper that was a timetable of where their children had been the previous week. Oh. You know, the daughter at, you know, at, at ballet, yeah. you know, the son at soccer training, and then just said, do you really want to pursue this? <laughs> like... It was extraordinary. And at the time of his death, he was, um, he'd been um, let off the firebombing charges. And that is still a great mystery because even though it was circumstantial, the three people and a couple of assaults all had one thing in common and that was Michael McGurk. And mm. I sort of feel if the DPP had proceeded with those criminal charges, he might not have been murdered but you know be that as it may so at the time he you know he had been charged with these fire bombings he had hired thugs to stand over and assault people he was trying to get money from like this was even while he was facing criminal mm. charges for fire bombing and assault he was still doing it and all of this beneath this v veneer of a Successful Sydney businessman yeah. with a lovely mansion in Cremorne. Yeah, the four kids children, and the you know the the fancy yeah. cars. Yes, I, I read your book had the perfect description of his house, which is where he was ultimately murdered. We'll come to that eventually, and you described the Dog's Leg Road and also the tennis court and the pool, which he put in despite council uh, illegally, restrictions. Yes. <laughs> I went on Google Maps on uh, it was Campbell Avenue, uh, Cranbrook home, Avenue, Cr Cranbrook Avenue. Yeah. Sorry, and. Uh, Straight away, I, I, that's the house. Oh, yes. The tennis court, the pool, and the dogs they growed, yeah. But when I was reading your book and and reflecting on this this extraordinary character, I mean, there's almost a sense in which someone like McGurk, as much as I hate to say it, is eventually going to end up dead uh, and not due to natural causes. <laughs> <laughs> if you take enough of these little risks in life, the probability adds up. But, but I was thinking about... Uh, I realized when I was reading your book, the historical analog for, for Michael McGurk uh, is John Law, who was another Scotsman on the make. He, he was born in Edinburgh, not Glasgow. And Law was uh, a, a murderer. Uh, he challenged one of his, his neighbors, uh, a neighbor who was disgruntled with Law and his wife, uh, to a duel and, and killed the neighbor and fled Edinburgh to Amsterdam in his, uh, I believe, his early 20s. Law was a flawed financial genius, a compulsive gambler, and a, a bit of a scallywag. Uh, I don't that think... That is it, very similar. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't what, think... And, and what time period are we talking about So this here? is the early 18th century. Right, okay. But Law's story gets more interesting <laughs> because he eventually, the, the chutzpah of Law, he persuaded the French government to uh, some scheme which became the Mississippi bubble. So the word bubble comes from French bull, B-U-L-L-E, -L -L -E, and that word comes from the Mississippi bubble, which broke down in May 1720. 
So that was law. And then he was on the run again from, from the French government. Uh, the word, actually, f- funnily enough, the word millionaire uh, came from, it was originally used to describe the beneficiaries of, of law's scheme in, oh, uh, wow. in France back in, the, in 1719. Um, but, but I thought, yeah, Michael McGurk is a, is a John Law. Um, but, but something striking about both characters is their ability to, I mean, they, they need to move on to new targets because they, they burn the bridge. Yes. They need to find new, new sources, new targets, but every time they are incredibly charismatic and persuasive until they milk someone dry. Right. But that's the thing. And I think to be, um, a successful fraudster, you do need to have superficial charm. Mm. You do need to have that chutzpah to convince people mm. to do what you want them to do. Did you find McGurk char- charming? Look, I think I have dealt with so many people, not like him, but I felt I could see through him and I could tell that he was trying to use me and my colleague Vander McGurk, uh, Vander McGurk, Vander Carson. <laughs> sorry, but um, and I'll just ex- go. I'll just step back a bit. Yeah. So, um, Vander and I, and at the time, um, Vander Carson was a business reporter at the Herald. We'd both hit upon exactly the same story, which was about the firebombing of the house. It was about a seventeen million dollar lawsuit, and it was about the funny, strange relationship between Michael McGurk, Ron Medich, and the fight about the Adam Tilly house and the mortgage. So this is how you entered the picture. Yes. So we did a front page story on this and we hadn't been able to get on to Michael McGurk despite our best efforts because he was down at the snow. So uh, when he came back to, from the snow, he wanted to talk and... Um, I was expecting this, you know, him to be incredibly angry because he had featured as a fire bomber and a lender of last resort. <laughs> but so we, we met him for lunch and the things that he told us over that lunch like later transpired to be absolutely spot on, you know, like details of, you know, corruption and, <clears throat> you know, things that were happening. Hmm. But I could tell he was using us, he was trying to get on our good side to divert attention away from himself and towards his nemesis, Ron Medich. Everything that he was telling us sort of was pointing towards you've got to look at Ron Medich. You've got to look at the rezoning of his land at Badgeries Creek. You've got to look at the fact that he had, um, you know, Graham Richardson, the former Labor power broker, on his his payroll as a lobbyist. You know, these are all things that are worth looking at. Anyway, so in between publishing the story and having lunch with him, the thing about, um, you know, the aftermath of any story, you get other information comes in. So we had all these people calling saying, have you heard about McGurk's tape? And it seemed to be a very poorly kept secret that earlier in the year of his death, McGurk had secretly recorded a conversation with Ron Medich. So sometime early 2009. Yeah, it was in February 2009. He was murdered in September 2009. So he'd secretly recorded this conversation and he was using that as an attempt to blackmail stroke extort money from Medich. So... You know, we asked him about the tape and he he sort of said, oh, what do you know about it? And so we said, oh, well, we've heard this, we've heard this. And he didn't dissuade us from any of that. He just said, look, you know, um, yes, I have a tape, but it's the time's not right yet. Anyway, so over the next um, – the that was the, the 29th of July we had lunch and then over the next couple of weeks he kept ringing and, you know, he'd drop off, you know, title deeds to Badgeries Creek and he'd do this and he'd do that, all trying to get us to look at Ron Medich. And I kept saying to him, but look at him for what? Oh, you know, the man's a criminal. And I said, yeah, but you haven't given any evidence. It's all very well for you to say that. Can't write a story. We can't it. write a story. Um, anyway, so... Um, on August, I think it was the 19th, 
the charges against him for the firebombing were dropped. And we had written a story saying, okay, still a mystery. The, the firebombing charges have been dropped. If McGurk didn't do it, who, who did? And we repeated, you know, the, the, the curious story about the house. And we now had more information about McGurk and Medic and their fights. Anyway, he rang up that morning and he was really angry and said, you don't get it. Ron Medich has a hit out on me. He's going to have me killed and Lucky Gadolari is going to do it. And I just thought, you know, honestly, people will say anything to get you to do a story. So you can imagine my shock when 10 days later I get a call at home half an hour after the incident has happened to say that McGurk's been shot dead in front of his nine-year-old son outside his house. Mm. You just think, oh, you know, it was just terrible, like really terrible. Take us through the day of the murder. You mean from the point of view of what the, of the, the participants were doing? Yes. Well, the funny thing is is that um, we actually thought that the murder was a professional hit. But when it all came out later, it was anything but. So <laughs> Lucky Gatilari had said to the um the, the hitman was in fact a guy called Hassam Safetli, who was a you know 43 year old accountant oh he wasn't an accountant sorry he'd been working as the general manager of a pimble accountancy firm only in the months leading up to becoming a paid assassin and his um uh, co-accused as it turned out was a 19 year old kid called Christopher Estefan, who was a friend of Safetli's nephew. So this was, I think, the third time on the 3rd of September that there'd been, you know, an attempt to kill McGurk. Um, only a couple of weeks earlier, there'd been three carloads of potential hitmen. Um, one carload with Safetli in it, one with Estefan in it, and one with these two other brothers who Safetli was paying to try and do the hit for them. So they, the three carloads had all met outside McGurk's house, but the house was dark, and then they decided perhaps they wouldn't break in because they didn't know where the bedroom was. So then they all packed up and went home again. So we fast forward to this day and Lucky Gatilari had said to them, you know, I need you to give me 24 hours notice of when you're going to do it so we can make sure that we're in a public place. So um, Safetli texted him the day before and said the tyres are about to be delivered. But I think, you know, they were so stupid, they kept getting confused as to what their codes were so they'd forgotten that the tyres being delivered was the code for the murder happening. Anyway, Lucky and Ron and Lucky's right-hand man, um, a bo former Bosnian soldier, Senad Kamenic, that had lunch at the same restaurant that is now the centre of um, an ICAC inquiry where the Chinese Friends of Labour <laughs> had dinner. So they had lunch there. Then they went downstairs in the same um, hay market, um, it's Market City down at, uh, in Sydney's Chinatown. They went downstairs to where they went most days, which was to the Babylon Massage Parlour. So they went down there where they, um, you know, enjoyed themselves. Got a massage. Yes, got a massage, had a happy ending. <laughs> and then um, I think L Lucky and Senard uh, drove home. And Ron went to have drinks with his stockbroker, Jared Farley, in Bly Street. Now, so while all this is happening, um, Safetli and um, uh, Estefan are outside McGurk's house in Cremorne. And Safetli, you know, becomes quite agitated. You know, it, they're, neither of them have done this before, so they need a drink to soothe their nerves. So Safetli dispatches the 19-year-old down the street, you know, to there's a little group of shops and there's a, um, a, a bottle shop down there to buy a bottle of bourbon. But the kid gets down there, he's not old enough to buy alcohol and because he hasn't got an ID, they say, look, I'm terribly sorry, but... 
we can't serve you. <laughs> so back he goes and then Safetli goes to the bottle shop. So here are the two would-be murderers, both seen at the scene just before the murder. So Safetli comes, um, you know, buys the bottle of bourbon, is swigging it as he goes back to the car. And then at 6.35, McGurk comes home with his um, his child, his nine-year-old boy. And the thing is, is that to this day, the police aren't sure which of them pulled the trigger. But one of them kills McGurk. And then the 19-year-old who's lost his licence almost crashes the car at the first roundabout. They then get on to Military Road where there's CCTV footage of them driving along. They don't have an e-tag, so they're photographed going across the bridge. And then um, as Bassam Safetli was later to tell people, this is um, Hayes' brother Bass, Hassam and Bassam as they were called, um, he tells people that on the night of the murder, they throw their clothes in to the um, a bin when they get home to burn them. And then his brother remembers that some of the murder money is in the back <laughs> pocket. So he burns his fingers trying to get his clothes <laughs> back out again. And as his brother said to Senate Kamenich, and people thought that this was a professional hit. Look at them. And you do think, you know, it was like the very next morning. Um, so it hasn't even been 24 hours and Safetli is still so pumped up. He pays for his girlfriend, Crystal, pays for a taxi to come from Annandale out to um, Eldersley. It was like a $300 cab fare. And then shows her that morning's paper and basically says, I did that. So she know, like everyone seems to have known. And not only that, both Lucky and Hassam Safetli had offered the contract killing to almost everyone they met. Like Hassam Safetli only mm. did it in the end because he'd accepted the money, but then he'd he'd paid one person a hundred thousand dollars to do the hit, and they would used it as a deposit on a house. <laughs> so, like, and they were just like really like idiots. Is it, so? Is that how much you get paid for a contract killing in Sydney? A hundred grand. Look, I think it depends on who. Sure. Yeah, on who yeah. you want killed, and and why you want them killed. Mm. But um, I think the entire cost for it wasn't just the contract killing of McGurk, it was also the subsequent intimidation of McGurk's widow, Kimberly. And I think that was a crucial part of the conviction of Ron Medich for the murder because the defence had tried to say that Lucky Gatilari had done this on his own because. Ron Medich, as you do, had invested $16 million into Lucky's failing electrical businesses. He'd already invested money into Lucky's failed winery, into Lucky's failed function centre, Lucky's failed uh, Aboriginal funeral fund. Everything that Lucky touched was a financial disaster, but it never stopped Ron Medich from ploughing more money in. But the thing that... Um, didn't make sense was that um, the only person who was chasing Michael McGurk's widow for money was Ron Medich. So, and there were phone taps with Ron Medich saying to anyone who would listen, she's got to be taught a lesson, you know, she can't go on doing this, you know, she's a crook like her husband. Hmm. So he was the only one with the motive to intimidate Kimberly, not Lucky had no motive to do that. So I think that was uh, important for the jury to see not only the murder but the intimidation um, as, you know, two linked crimes. Mm. Now, how many years did it take the police to eventually charge and arrest Medich? Well, it took them um, 13 months to charge and arrest Lucky, Senate Kamenich, Estefan and Safetli. Mm. But the funny thing was they didn't arrest Ron Medich. And at the time I kept thinking, 
well, have we been wrong all this time mm. presuming that Ron Medic was the mastermind? But what had happened was that the police had initially got enough information to charge Safetli because the girlfriend, um, he'd started harassing the girlfriend. She had taken an AVO out and she said, the reason why I'm frightened is this is what he did to Michael McGurk. They also had one of the um, uh, one of the enforcers that Safetli had paid the hundred thousand dollars to 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 do the hit. Um, he had been caught doing something else, and in order to minimise his sentence, he said, "I will give you the murder of Michael McGurk." So they had they basically had Safetli. But they needed to put pressure on him to bring in other people. So he wore a wire and he taped um, Senate Kamenich and Lucky Gadalari. So they had enough money, they had enough information to charge them. What they were hoping to do was then to wire up um, Lucky Gadalari to bring in Medich. But they were worried that um, Lucky and Ron and Kamenich might kill Safetli because he was capable of bringing them all undone. So they made their arrests and at that time they didn't have enough information to arrest uh, Medich because Lucky had handled all the arrangements. Safetli, the murderer, had only one meeting ever with Medich and that's when a month before the murder... Lucky had introduced him to Ron and said, you've just got to say you're the new guy, even though he'd had the, he was going to be doing the contract killing for a, you know months but just couldn't bring himself to do it. Mm. So there was only that one meeting. So Safetli um, really couldn't give evidence enough to implicate Ron in the murder. So it was interesting, you know, what happens – when you have money, what 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 justice can buy? Because um, upon his arrest, um, Lucky got a message to Ron Medich saying, "I'll need a million dollars for both bail and for my defence." And Ron walked away. And you know, Gadlari couldn't believe it. He'd done this murder for this man. This had been his closest friend. And he was just let him, letting him take the rap for the murder. So it was only after he realised that Ron was just abandoning him that he started to talk to police. And it was about a fortnight after his arrest that they then charged Ron Medich with the murder. So, you know, really Lucky Gatilari was the key and you know perhaps the only witness that the jury relied on to um you know have a guilty verdict against medich wow i really want to ask you some uh general patterns and principles now but i actually think it's worth stopping it at one other story briefly before we do that in uh, i think it was 1995 or thereabouts Someone leaving court spat on your leg and said, you've ruined my oh, life. Oh, right. Who was it oh, and okay. why did they do that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was that was one of my favourites. Um, that was, in fact, very famous jockey Jim Cassidy. And what had happened was that um, I had been leaked what became famously known as the jockey tapes. And what it was was that it was phone taps and surveillance of a major organised crime figure called Victor Spink, who not only was importing um, large quantities of drugs, he was also on the phone to jockeys, getting them to fix races. However, um, in the end, the, the three jockeys, while they received lengthy bans from racing, in the end it was decided just to charge them with pretending to tip not with actually giving um, information. Anyway, so Jim Cassidy was banned for three years and he was banned right on the eve of the Golden Slipper and he was the jockey on the race favourite. Anyway, so 
um, at the tribunal where he'd just been banned, you know, we came outside and he saw me and he spat on <laughs> me. Um, and I laugh, you know, it wasn't actually on the back. It was only on the back of my legs because he was so small. But um, And he just said, you know, you effing bitch, you've ruined my life. And I sort of turned around and I thought, I don't, I, why is it that journalists are always blamed? No mm. one ever blames themselves for the fact that they've been caught. It is always somebody else's fault mm. other than their own. How did you how did you gather your information and evidence? We you walking around the racetrack following people. No, no, no. Look, um, um, I can't say who, but um, I was uh, leaked <clears throat> the the tapes themselves. But it was funny at the time because we faced or I faced a two year jail sentence because the tapes had been made by the Australian Federal Police mm. and under the Telecommunications Interception Act, they could only be used for the prosecution of that particular matter. They couldn't be used for a newspaper story. If we'd been sued for defamation, we couldn't rely on the tapes either. And in fact, it was a two-year jail term to be using information from that tape. And I can remember um, our lawyer being just surprisingly enthusiastic about going ahead and publishing these tapes. And um, at the time, I was um, pregnant and he said, oh, no, no, he said, see, they're never going to jail a, um, a pregnant woman. They'll, they'll jail our editor-in-chief, John Alexander. <laughs> so he was seemed to be rather enthusiastic at this prospect. So it, no charges okay. came to pass. <laughs> Let me ask you one final story, Uh Craig Thompson and the Health Services Union. Were you the one who brought all that undone and exposed it? Look, one of my other colleagues at the Herald had done the initial story about Craig Williamson using... Craig health, Thompson. Craig, sorry, Craig Thompson. Sorry, Craig Thompson using health services um, union money for prostitutes. So he was the secretary at the time. He was the... Um, no, that was Michael Williamson. Um, at the time, Craig Thompson had been um, one of the officials in right. the Health Services Union. But at the time of the story, he'd actually become the Labor um, a Labor member of federal parliament. Mm. So then what had happened was that um, a, a parent at school with Michael Williamson had rung up and said to me, um, well, you should forget about Craig Thompson. You should be looking at uh, Michael Williamson. And I said, oh, I've never heard of him. Who is he? And he said, oh, God, he's the boss of the Health Services Union and he's also the federal president of the Labor Party. And I said, yeah, why should I be looking at him? And he said, look, you know, um, union bosses – get. Uh, um, it's the salary of their highest organiser. He said, so say that's 120000 This guy has got five kids at private schools. He and his wife drive top of the, la top of the range mm. Mercedes. They travel first class and they outbid us at the school charity auction. Right. It so does, doesn't add up. It doesn't add up. And you know what? That is as good a reason mm. to look at something as any any hmm. anyway so after um look honestly it only took about a week and i think people heard that i was making investigations i then got information that both craig thompson and michael williamson had been given american express cards that were attached to the account of the union's printer so basically that could be seen as a criminal offence in providing, um, you know, an inducement for a contract. Mm. So they're inflating the price of the printing contract and they're being paid by getting an American Express card. It's a secret commission, mm. in fact. Anyway, so um, – and not only that, Michael Williamson was, um, you know, he – he secretly owned the company that was providing the t telecommunications and computer contracts for a year. He'd used the union's architect to renovate his his house and his beach house. 
look, it just went on and on. But I remember the night before writing the stories uh, or the day before ringing um, Michael Williamson and I remember getting back a legal threat that if you write one word of this and we'll have no hesitation but suing you. And I remember sort of feeling absolutely sick about doing the story because, um, you know, we'd got somebody at Amex to say, yep, we've got the card details here. But I had not seen a single piece of paperwork, which is like really unusual to, mm. to do a story without having cited it yourself. But my source was really good. Anyway, um, we ran the story and then it just opened the floodgate. As I was saying to you before, one story then brings in, you know, a whole lot of other stuff. Like he was, um, you know, he had a mistress in the union and she was getting kickbacks and he'd given his son, um, the union had bought an $800,000 building that his own son was using as a recording studio. And in the end, Michael Williamson went to jail for five years and they found that he had taken – he was charged over having taken a couple of million dollars from the union. But behind the scenes, the police thought he might have taken up to $20 million. Wow. And um, he's now out of jail. And interestingly, um, he and his wife divorced just before he went into jail so she could keep – the house and various things. And guess what? They're back together. Well, yeah, but it's funny that, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, Craig Thompson, for his part, I think he was originally given a 12-month sentence, but that was taken down to a $25,000 fine. Look there, was, and look, there was a problem with the prosecution. This is in Victoria. He'd been, prosecu he'd been prosecuted under a different form of the act because he was facing, you know, criminal charges and possible jail. And in the end, he got um, a good behaviour bond. But he has recently um, had to hand in his practising certificate as a solicitor because mm. the courts determined that he wasn't a fit and proper person. Mm. And I think he's facing um, – I think he might be facing bankruptcy because I think the union is still pursuing him trying to get back mm. his – um, that the money that he took. I remember watching him uh, weeping in Parliament you know, oh. when he was using parliamentary privilege to to speak about, you know, the people going after him, and it was it, painful to watch. Look, it was painful to watch because I knew that he was an out and out liar. Right. And it's funny that you you know you meet people and they can look you right in the eye yeah. and lie to your face, and in fact. You know, one of the fascinating things was that he had initially sued the Herald over our first claims that he'd used his union card to pay for prostitutes. So during the course of discovery for that court case, not only was it revealed that he had um, used the card, more information had come out about his signatures, about his bills, and in the end... He folded. Yeah. He paid our legal costs. And yet he told his parliamentary colleagues and he told another inquiry that the Herald had paid him money, that he'd secretly won the case because um, our own handwriting expert had determined that it wasn't his signature. That was all... <laughs> Complete lies, but also um, eagerly, I mean, easily proved that it was lies. So it was like just, I mean, remarkable. And and mm. in the end, I think his lawyer said, um, his lawyer had admitted in his, you know, criminal case that um, he told those lies because he was under a lot of public pressure and his marriage was in difficulty. And you think that's... You know, you told those lies for about five years consecutively. Mm. But anyway. Okay, so general principles and patents, finally. I think in, in analysing crooks and frauds and swindlers, it's worth distinguishing two broad sort of categories of people, the sociopaths and the non-sociopaths, just to begin with. Yes. Now, you clearly think Michael McGurk was a sociopath. 
how many of the other people you've exposed or gone after over the years, including, you know, the jockey and Craig Thompson, Williamson, fit into that sociopath bucket? Look, I think um, I think quite a lot do, and especially those on who perpetrate fraud. I right. think fraud has a special attraction for sociopaths just because of that ability to ruin the lives, often, you know, financially of other people and never lose a moment's sleep. I mean, other crimes are opportunistic um, and people do it because they can. But I just think those sort of fraudsters and murderers, they are like your true sociopaths. And there's also, I think, quite a few of them in suits in high places, <laughs> in our public companies. Yep. No, just that, that they have that degree of ruthlessness to get ahead. They have no trouble in, um, you know, crushing rivals, in stepping over people, mm -hmm. in just having those blinkers on. You know, they don't care who they destroy to get to the top. Mm. So I think there's a lot more of you know, sociopathic tendencies than in in business and crime than people think that there is. What do you think the inner emotional life of a sociopath is like? I think there's not much of an inner life at all. I think that um, there's superficial charm, but there's not actually much attachment Um it's all, everything is a means to an end. And it's also that inability to stick at one thing. It's, mm. um, you need to keep perpetuating, I think, those certain thrills of, you know, like rather than having a good business and sticking at it, there's that lack of attention, that need to be, going on to to do mm. something else it's that that constant need for basically the i don't know whether it's the thrill of the chase or the thrill of the crime but it never seems to be able to be satisfied the reckless thrill seeking is a really interesting tell for sociopaths i think that's often an an overlooked uh red flag yes yes yeah and i think you you were right when you were saying about um um, John Law, I think it was about you know about the gambling, yeah. the um, you know often the use of um, you know prostitution. It's that risk taking, thrill seeking behaviour mm. that um, you know it's living life on the edge. At which point in your interactions with McGurk did you cotton onto the fact that he was probably a sociopath? I, look, I have to say, certainly not sitting across the table at lunch because he was, you know, superficially very mm. charming. It was only when the extent of what he'd been doing, um, you know, later emerged and you realised that, um, you know, he was having people threatened. He was doing all these, like, astonishing amount of mm. criminality. But to meet him, you would never pick those things just from having lunch. Right. You know, you would have to observe someone for a while to get the full idea of what he was like. Mm. For the, the non-sociopathic fraudsters, ha have you met many people in that category? There seems to be almost a tragic quality to those people. Look, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I, right. I, yes, I think there's, there's all, all manner and, and like, there's borderline. A, a friend of mine distinguishes between fraud by... Yeah necessity and fraud by design and a lot of people begin their careers as fraudsters due to necessity and it's usually small fraud uh, and then eventually they realize I can get away with this do a little bit more and when you follow that chain of rationalization it, it evolves into something which the end product looks like the work of a sociopath but really it's quite a uh, well, uh, uh, for want of a better word, tragic circumstance. Well, also you look at, um, you know, like say uh, people who've done insider trading or have stolen from their um, employer 
you know, you'll see that they'll, as you say, they'll start with a little bit mm. and a little bit more. And then I think it just seems really easy. And once you've done it and you've, you have seemingly got away with it rather easily, I think it sort of, it escalates. And often those people do have a conscience and do feel really bad mm. when they have been caught as opposed to other people who are only sad that they've been caught. They're not sad about what they actually did. Mm. What's the biggest tell for you that someone's been involved in dirty dealings? Whether it's in their body language or it's kind of in the circumstantial evidence, when do you, when you're, you know, you're triaging which stories to work on, when do you think there's probably something here, I'm going to keep working on it? Look, it's more... Um, you look for patterns. Right. It's it's like anything else. You look for patterns of behaviour. Um, like, for instance, if a property development company um, has closed down one company and then has phoenixed it, as in, you know, all the debts, all the money you owe to the tradesman has gone down the gurgler with that company. Once you start doing other searches they've done it before so it's that pattern of behavior and yep. it's if you've ripped off one person you've ripped off others and it's the same with even the me too movement if you have sexually assaulted or harassed one person there's every chance that there is a harvey weinstein or perhaps not to that extent but there is a pattern mm -hmm. of behavior so it's always looking for those patterns that, as a journalist, you try to follow or you just follow the money. If there's a, a cockroach in the kitchen, there's usually more than one. <laughs> that, very well said. <laughs> Kate, this has been absolutely fascinating. I can't thank you enough. Joe, uh, it's been my pleasure. I thought finally we would end on a, a quote from a, a very distinguished person about you, in fact. Uh, and the speaker was... Australia's former Prime Minister, Paul Keating. <laughs> I know you've heard this one many times before. He once said about you, is this woman a stalker or is she just underemployed? Will we find her next sniffing bicycle seats in Darling Harbour? You know what? And I always, I always he's think... He's always, always good for a zinger. I know, what but what I was that think, about? I think that was about... Because um, oh like, I've written about Paul Keating and his piggery, Paul Keating and his, you know, various various things. Um, but I think that says a lot more about him than it does about me. I mean, who would even think of saying such a thing? You know, sniffing bicycle seats. I mean, really? <laughs> I don't even go through garbage bins. <laughs> Kate McClymont, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. For links and show notes for everything we discussed, you can find those on my website. It's www.josephnoelwalker.com. That's my full name, J-O-S-E-P-H-N-O-E-L-W-A-L-K-E-R.com. You can also find me on Twitter. My handle is at Joseph N. Walker on The Bird Place. And until next time, thank you for your time. I appreciate you. Ciao.